Hello and welcome to Raj Sabha TV. You're watching To The Point with the host, Rajat Kane. Well, in this special edition of the show, we are joined with Dr. Sudhir Kumar, Professor at Temple University. He is leading researcher in terms of microbiology. Now, here in his latest research, or to say a thesis, I mean, I beg your pardon, or rather a hypothesis that he has, he has conducted on COVID-19 virus and its spread, he has actually worked on the progenitor, in simple words, the ancestor genome of the COVID-19. Now, why it's important? It's important, A, we don't know too much about this virus. This is one virus that has baffled science to mankind, to governments across the globe. We have seen second wave has been extremely catastrophic in India. And prior to that, this virus has cast a devious spell in several countries across Europe to US to other continents as well. How this research of understanding the ancestor of COVID-19 would rather help us in having more knowledge about the virus and, of course, like how to tackle it further, we are joined with Dr. Sudhir Kumar. Sir, pleasure to have you on the show and really many thanks to you for sparing a time for us and, you know, joining us uh, from US. So over to you. I would like to straight away start. What is the study and what inspired you to conduct this study? Great. Uh, Rajat, thank you so much for having me on your program. It's wonderful to speak to the Indian audience uh, through your medium. And uh, as you mentioned very nicely, that this particular uh, virus or pathogen has really made human life miserable. We have lost so many friends, families, and loved ones, and members of our human community. So to begin with, anyone studying any kind of genes, viruses, microbes will automatically be drawn to the problem. This is a problem that we must all join hands in solving. So from my perspective, my interest is in tracing back the history mm -hmm. of any kind of organism, whether it is humans, whether it is animals, whether it is plants or any other species. And coronavirus, which causes COVID-19, is a prime example of where these kinds of research we do is directly applicable. So a couple of years ago, uh, basically in January 2020, when I learned about this disease along with everyone else uh, on Earth, we started to understand, uh, wonder where did it come from? Mm -hmm. How far back in time did it exist? Uh, because clearly Wuhan, China was the first place we noticed it. And we made connections, uh, many scientists did, and uh, other members of the community regarding where it could have come from. But ultimately, fortunately, all these viruses, all the uh, organisms carry genes. And these genes change over time. We have become very used to variants or mutants that we observe all the time. We call some variants have arisen in India, some in China, some in Italy, some in other countries. So by, by looking at these variants, in the, in the past, we have studied all sorts of organisms. So we thought we will use the same information which is variants right. found in coronaviruses to trace back their history because history is powerful. It tells us how far back in time did it start. Potentially, we can find out whether the Wuhan strain or variant was actually the starting variant. Mm. It may have been, uh, may have come from some other coronavirus variant that was yet right. to be discovered at that time. So mm -hmm. that's where the interest that I have comes in this area. Right, sir. So in terms of the primal findings, and of course, like tracing back the ancestor or to say the progenitor of, of this uh, COVID-19 virus, what were the final findings of it in terms of the characteristics, in terms of, say, uh, if you talk about severity and spread, which is, which is prime focus these days to study either the virus itself or, or its mutants? Yeah, absolutely. That's the really a burning question that we had from the beginning. So mm -hmm. our first question was, was the, uh, the variant found in Wuhan as soon as we detected this virus in China, in different parts of China, was that the actual ancestor of all the human infections? The so human infections that happened in the US, in India, in China, throughout Asia, throughout Africa. So was that Wuhan strain, that one strain that was found in Wuhan along with a few others, similar ones, were they the ancestor? 
which which would have been a very interesting finding or was mm -hmm. there something else that Wuhan, yeah. that this particular virus was spreading in china around the mm -hmm. world even before right. wuhan and wuhan happens to be what we call the super spreading event it was the first mm -hmm. time it spread a lot and we were able to see it uh, generally when some viruses are found in small amounts quantities we don't notice them we don't realize they are a new disease so from that perspective it was very in important to find out if the wuhan virus was the progenitor of all the viruses and mm -hmm. so what we did is we took the genes of uh, tens of thousands of genomes or, or viruses mm -hmm. found in large number of people who were infected by it throughout the world over um, more than 15 months and we reconstructed back the history and what we found was that the wuhan strain that we first found in december 2019 that strain was actually a uh, offspring or a child okay. of this ancestor so it is almost like uh, i use the analogy gra great grandfather so basically mm -hmm. the wuhan strain if you think of that as a child then there was a parent which was one mutation away one variant away mm -hmm. then its parent and then its parent so essentially right. the wuhan strain was three steps away from the the ancestor the progenitor what we call mm -hmm. from which all the strains found in humans all the variants found in humans are actually descended from So it's basically like a family where great grandfather mm -hmm. has children, and they have children, right. and they have children, and today you have a big family with great grandfather along with everyone else living together in the same city, maybe in the same mm -hmm. world if they travel to different parts of the world. So what we trace back is the sequence of the great grandfather, and great grandfather existed most likely uh, much much before December 2019. Okay. Uh, maybe October, September 2019, or maybe earlier, uh, because mm -hmm. at this point we do not have any data from from patients directly before December 2019. So December 2019 is the only data we have, and later. Right. So I mean, interestingly, as as your study also traces back uh, uh, the progenitor of this virus to Wuhan strain. Uh, there has been several other studies. Some of them, of course, has been anonymous work. If you have come across, uh, like on the on the online space, and there are there are some doctors who are doing a study of of tracing the origin of the virus. Sure. Now, uh, what have you found? Like, I would like to hear from you. Uh, is it a natural, naturally occurring virus, or there is something more to it? Yeah, so that is also a big question in the community. Everyone would like to know: Is it a human-engineered uh, virus? Is mm -hmm. it a laboratory-evolved virus, right. or is it a naturally evolved virus? There are three types of possibilities. Uh, and if that happened, where did it happen? So, in each mm -hmm. case, you want to know where it happened. So, as for the human-manufactured virus, there have been studies published in really prestigious journals, which have clearly shown that. it is not like one of those lego style virus where you took a took pieces of different viruses together and combined them it seems highly unlikely that it is one of those assembled virus so it is not in that sense human made it is not manufactured in a laboratory the second possibility is that it has been evolved in a laboratory over time for some purpose and it has leaked into the population and that hypo for that hypothesis it's very hard to prove or disprove it because we need information from the laboratory where it happened mm -hmm. and this is what i think many people are interested in knowing could it be in china or could it be right. elsewhere we actually mm -hmm. don't know uh, where it could have happened because we have no data from laboratory studying coronavirus in that way the third mm -hmm. one is could it be naturally occurring it mm -hmm. evolved let's say in a bat potentially and then jump to humans so that mm -hmm. particular hypothesis has a lot of merit because this jumping from another animal to humans happens all the time all the okay. flu or swine flu bird flu a flu, a flu pandemic every year is jumping from some other species and same is true for uh, sars 1 when sars 1 was uh, came around 20 years ago it jumped from a civet then same is true for mers which is potentially have jumped from camels 
So really, jumping from other species to humans is so common that it appears to be today, among scientists, a primary hypothesis they think will explain what has happened in the, in the coronavirus case. Hmm. Studying virus deeply uh, is really important, or for that matter, studying any uh, microorganism is, is important, not just for the microbiologists, but also for community at large, especially so as to figure out its, its characteristic. How complex uh, you would say uh, studying coronavirus is it, given several strains, like now we have from alpha to several other Greek alphabets uh, based on the location or origin of the countries. So how difficult or rather challenging, let's say, let's, how challenging is it to study this virus per se? So the virus is challenging to study in that you have to do study it in a very high security containment facility. So therefore, mm -hmm. that has to have a very high biosafety level because you don't want any strains you have in the lab to go out. So this is, mm -hmm. this is really a big infrastructure problem and very few groups can study it because of that reason. And the second one is that you need to know what you are studying. In this case, we are now interested in studying, a lot of people are doing this, a lot of researchers, which particular strain acts most highly on which particular vaccine, which vaccine can it escape. So we are interested in that. So that is another study they do. So from with respect to molecular biology, given good infrastructure, it is not difficult to study, but it is a lot of people that need to study it from different angles to understand coronavirus. And, mm. and that, that is happening. Uh, and the other, other study that I think you know we are doing a lot everywhere in the world is sequencing the, gene, the genes of this virus, which is, which is called you know, genome sequencing. And mm. that is how we do surveillance. And that one is much simpler, still not trivial, and many, many countries are able to do it. And right now, more than one and a half million, more than 15 lakh uh, genomes have been sequenced. And that is why we can now make so many inferences about new variants, when a variant is new, where it might have first arisen. So right. the studies can be done on the genome level and at the gene level and at the function level. So they are mm -hmm. all very doable, but you need to have really good infrastructure and biosafety to do it. Uh, sir, looking forward, uh, I know your, your study is extremely important. Now, if you want to carry forward your study and uh, how will it help in terms of using it for community purpose, for, say, putting it into more medical purpose, medicinal purpose, uh, if I may say, uh, here, like, in terms of treatment protocol, will the studying uh, or rather understanding uh, the progenitor or the ancestor of this virus help us in understanding how to counter it medically? Yeah. So that's a great question, and we always ask that question. So we start with a fundamental uh, interest in knowing history of any pathogen. Mm -hmm. So we do that. But why study the evolution of a pathogen, ancestor, or even over time, what's happening? Mm -hmm. So actually, we don't realize, but all of these variant names are coming from evolutionary analysis of the virus. So if we didn't do the evolutionary analysis of the virus, we have no idea what is a new strain and what is not a new strain. So evolutionary biology, from that perspective, is very important. The second one is it allows us to categorize viruses like it does for animals or species into different groups. So we can find mm -hmm. out which groups are emerging. It's also telling us which groups can emerge very frequently. For example, right. the India, uh, the strain in South Africa, strain in UK that has very problematic spike protein mutations arose independently. That means this virus the dangerous mutations potentially could arise in different parts of the world separately. And then knowing the progenitor is very important because if the progenitor occurred and it required extra mutations to become pathogenic, then mm -hmm. we know which particular variants were specific, uh, specifically very important. So what we hope right. was when we get the progenitor and we look at its sequence, its genes, and compare this to genes of what happened in China and other countries, we could find these turnkey variants that mm -hmm. made it really transmissible. Mm -hmm. But what we found instead is the progenitor itself was able to transmit. In fact, progenitor okay. was found in January 2020, February 2020, March 2020. So it's like grandfather was living alongside its, uh, his grandchildren and its children. Mm -hmm. 
So it's like a whole family. So fa the viruses have a family tree too. So the coronaviruses mm -hmm. have a family tree. And yes. many members of the family are infecting us all the time. So mm -hmm. I think by studying evolution of this virus, its history, medically we can inform now, look, this virus was already pre-equipped in October potentially with mm -hmm. all the mutations it needed to infect humans and spread in the human population. And then over time it has changed and moved around throughout the world even faster. So mm -hmm. I think from that perspective, knowing the progenitor and its early history has become very illuminating with respect to how well equipped it is. And we hope that in the future, people will sequence the virus from uh, November 2019, October 2019, you know, August 2019 to find out if its ancestor existed in humans already and mm -hmm. what, the, but probably we have already uh, predicted what they will look like and we will find out if that is exactly what they look like. Now, that's really important, extremely important. Sir, uh, just as we uh, close the show, rather we go towards closing the show, sir, uh, just a couple of last questions, sir. So first, like, uh, ha is the ancestor or the progenitor virus also, uh, you know, uh, slick in terms of its severity and spread? Because that, as, as you also uh, mentioned, that this is a paramount concern for the scientists and for the communities at large. Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. And this is the question in which a lot of people uh, sort of make an interpretation that I think sometimes goes in the wrong direction. So when we see a strain, like in India, mm -hmm. there have been some strains that have grown a lot in number. We say, oh, this, this strain is more transmissible or less transmissible. But what happens is the virus spread is dictated by many things. First is mm -hmm. everybody wore a mask, as you have advocated before, many, many times on your show, yes. there would be no evolution of virus because mm -hmm. virus evolves in us. When we get sick with coronavirus, within two weeks, a new variant is born because okay. this virus changes 24 times a year. Mm -hmm. So therefore, every two weeks, a new variant is born. So everybody who has coronavirus infection is carrying a mutant, a variant. Okay. Okay. And so if they, if they wear a mask, that they won't have the coronavirus and there will not be the evolving mechanism. Then mm -hmm. if they wear the mask and don't transmit it, then mm -hmm. any mutant they, they produce in their body would actually be automatically killed because they are mm -hmm. not transmitting it. If they don't transmit it, the virus that they made is dead. So okay. I think this kind, this mask wearing is our ability or our or staying mm -hmm. at home is our uh, contribution to stopping the evolution of coronavirus. And when mm -hmm. we can stop the evolution of coronavirus, it will go extinct. And that, mm -hmm. I think, is where we ultimately need to be. However, if we go to a big gathering, like a wedding, and we meet many people, even if we carry normal strains that are old strains, it will spread like wildfire. And mm. it has nothing to do with the virus severity. It has to do with our behavior and our mm -hmm. transmission. So this is called demographic issue. So basically, right. many, many spreads of viruses are due to demography, and some mm -hmm. are likely due to the mutations. So mm -hmm. I think we can control demography, and once we control demography, we will control the variants. And mm -hmm. that is the reason why it has potentially disappeared from China. They controlled mm -hmm. it really, I feel. Uh, in America also, we have controlled it with uh, vaccination a lot in some other countries like UK. And in India, I think it is getting controlled because everybody is getting exposed to it and generating antibodies. So slowly, mm -hmm. it is declining in numbers. But still, this virus for anybody who is not vaccinated is actually a vehicle for the virus to right. evolve. And that, therefore, is dangerous, I feel, for humankind. Right. Absolutely, sir. We, uh, that, that's very important. So clearly, as uh, you mentioned, as you underlined, and so has several experts. I mean, COVID-appropriate behavior plus vaccination is one of the important, rather the important tools to fight and, of course, counter this virus and stop or rather arrest its spread. Sir, we sign off on this note. Many thanks uh, for joining us and elucidating on 
your extremely important research, understanding how virus came into being, understanding its progenitor or ancestor, to say of in simple words for our viewers. And that, of course, will go a long way in understanding this virus and, of course, having a treatment protocol for community at large. Many thanks, uh, Dr. Sudhir Kumar, for Professor Temple University for joining us. So clearly, viewers, uh, this is uh, the end of the show. But before we leave, there is a small appeal to all of us that please keep following COVID-appropriate behavior, keep wearing face masks, and do not forget to maintain social distancing. And of course, please get yourself vaccinated as soon as possible. Many thanks. You're watching Raj Sabha TV to the point with the host, Rajakane. That's time to go for, for me Thank to go. So Thank much, you. Guys. Goodbye. Thank <laughs> you.